words of that hymn, of course, but I'm quite sure it was something like that that they sang at the end of Ezra chapter 6 when the people of God celebrated the salvation of God when they kept the feast of the Passover. So will you turn with me to the sixth chapter of the book of Ezra. And you may have already noticed that we have before us this morning in our normal sequence of studies a chapter that is singularly appropriate for a communion Sunday. Because the heart of this chapter is the remembrance of what God had done for the salvation, the life, the blessing, and the future of his people. That's what the feast of the Passover was all about. But first, if we are to understand and learn from the story of Ezra, there are two things that we need to keep in mind as we go through the book chapter by chapter. And the first thing to remember is that this is an ongoing story covering many years. The story of Ezra goes on into the story of Nehemiah, but it doesn't stop at the end of the book of Nehemiah. The story goes on for long, long years after that, years concerning which there is nothing recorded in the Bible, but quite a lot recorded in secular history. But the story goes on until eventually, in the beginning of the Gospels, the story is taken up again with the details of the birth of Jesus Christ of the Virgin Mary in the stable at Bethlehem. That's the context of what we are studying in the book of Ezra. The second thing we have to remember is that it is the story of God at work in the world. And there are lots of people, you see, who don't believe that God is at work in the world, but he is. Whether we see it or not, or whether we believe it or not. If, if you want to believe that the whole history of the world is, is just a, a sequence of events co conditioned by economic and political considerations, then you accept that bleak, hopeless philosophy. I refuse to believe that. The story we have here is the story of God at work in the world, bringing to pass, that is, developing in sequence, his plan of salvation. And to do so, the story tells of God dealing with his own people, the Jews, in order to make them effective instruments of his will. And God dealing also with a variety of nations and governments, ruling and overruling and causing them to do his will, even though at times, at many times, they had very mixed motives for what they did. But whether their motives were true or false, whether they were aware of it or not aware of it, even if they had resented the suggestion of it, they were being used by God to fulfill his sovereign purpose of salvation here in this world. From the start of the book of Ezra down to the beginning of chapter 4, that covers something like 20 years. By the time we come to chapter 6 at verse 15, another six years have gone past. When you come to chapter 7 verse 1, as we will do in a couple of weeks' time, another 40 years have gone past. You see, time is, time is rolling on. I don't know how many people already have said to me, I can hardly believe it's June already. Where has half of the year gone? Well, the next half will go past every bit as quickly, and the year after that, there's an old redemption hymn that says, Time is earnest passing by. 
passing by more quickly than we realize. And in the context of the fleeting moments of time, we have God saying, as we said the other Sunday, now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. We have traced the story of Ezra, the story of the Jews, returning from their captivity in Babylon after 70 years of exile, the story that tells of how God in his sovereign grace gave his people a new beginning. Oh, what a God he is. He's always giving a new beginning. Thank God for that. And the people of God back in their own land and back to the city of Jerusalem were aware of the fact that their God had worked wonders for them. They never expected things to turn out like this. And there was a great surge of spiritual enthusiasm. And the altar of God was the first thing they did when they got back to Jerusalem. They cleared the rubble and they built the altar of God as if they were making a clear affirmation that God had to be at the very center of this new phase of life that had been granted to them. They were really saying, as for us, God first. And as they built the altar, and this becomes evident in a communion Sunday, they were really saying, God has to be remembered. And what God has done for us has to be remembered. And the altar was also a reminder to the people that if their life and their work were to be effective, then they had to be right with God. It's no use trying to be, no use trying to serve God if your heart and your life are not right with God. All you'll do is to create confusion and you will get in the way of God's purposes. Christian service begins by being right with God. And so the new phase, the new beginning had really a great start. And then, of course, I'm revising what we've been saying these past Sundays. Then there came adversaries, opponents, critics, difficulties, opposition. And gradually there came upon the people of God, for whom God had done so much so recently over a number of years, there came upon them a spirit of apathy. I'm not sure if it was a spirit of, of complacency, it was certainly a spirit of apathy. I was looking up Paul's letter to the Galatians, he said Galatians chapter 5, I forget which verse it was, where Paul said to these Christians, Oh, you began well. Who hindered you? Or what hindered you? And oh, how often we've seen this over the years. People, people coming to God through Jesus Christ. People claiming Christ as their Savior. Launching into Christian service. And oh, your heart is glad as you see their eagerness. And then there comes a time where in your heart you say, Oh, they began well. What's, what's happened? The, the fires have died down. A spirit of apathy. And then there came, as we discovered last week when we studied chapter 5, there came into that situation the prophets Haggai and Zechariah. I commend you again, read the three chapters of Haggai and the first four or five chapters of Zechariah and see the kind of preaching. And these prophets came with their preaching and Haggai in particular came with a word of challenge and he said to them, you, 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 he spoke to the congregation, he said, you, you, you're saying it's, it's not, t yes we'll get round to it, but it's, it's not time to build the house of God. You've had time to build your houses. Get your priorities right, said Haggai. Get your priorities right in times of the dedication of your time and of your energy. And that may be a word to a lot of us this morning. 
And if that was the basis of Haggai's challenging ministry, the basis of Zechariah's ministry was encouragement. When he spoke to the people of God's love and of God's protection and of God's plans, and oh, there came upon them a new, a new spirit of realism, and they got on with the building of the house of God. Do you remember we quoted towards the end of the sermon last Sunday morning some of the things that God said to his people through the prophet Haggai. Haggai said, do you not realize that you are the apple of God's eye? No doubt some in the congregation said, oh, come off it. No, said Zechariah, I won't come off it. It's true. Look at that table and the broken bread and the poured out wine. Look at the cross. And remember what the scripture says. God commended his love toward us. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It's true. We are the apple of his eye. Remember Zechariah said to the people, Oh, you, your God is round about you personally and round about your work like a, a wall of fire. Yes, is, yes, said Zechariah. Do you not realize that if, if, if you get stuck into the work, if you get on with it in your devotion to God and your dedication to God, the very glory of God will be in the midst of you. And I'm not surprised that they got started. And although it doesn't say it in as many words, I'm sure these people of God began to pray. There must have been evidence of the fact that they, be, that they were a praying people because we find even Darius, the pagan king of Persia, in chapter 6 at verse 10, that they may offer pleasing sacrifices to the God of heaven and pray for the life of the king and his family. Oh, said Darius, I, I don't understand these, these, these gospel things. I don't understand the God of salvation, but they, they, they're folk who pray. And I want them to pray for me. And so they began to pray. And I think that is the lesson of chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. When the word of God is introduced to the situation, when the word of God is received and responded to, when there is a new commitment to God and to his work, and when God's people pray, then things began, begin to happen. And that brings us to the story of chapter 6. Keep in mind, of course, that these are the people whom God had blessed. Remember the psalm they would sing when they, were, when they were released from their captivity? When the Lord turned the captivity of Zion, we were like, we were like them that dream. Oh, we could hardly believe it. But these people whom God had blessed so richly had grown apathetic and complacent and casual. And they were no longer alive to God as they had once been. Chapter 4 told us of how there was a protest by the adversaries in the situation to the central government and the work was stopped. And then in chapters 5 and 6, after the work had started again, the same thing happened. Protest to the central government. And again, search was made. And I think this time, the civil servants did their job properly. And they don't always. On the previous occasion, they had looked up some reference and they said, oh yes, these Jews, they're a, they're a bad lot. And the work was stopped. This time the search was done properly. And they came to the decree of Cyrus. And the work was vindicated. And King Darius said, Keep your hands off this work that belongs to God. 
And that's a permanent word to all those who take it upon themselves to be critics of and opponents of and denigrators of any work of God. I can imagine the Jews on the second occasion waiting patiently for the response from the capital with regard to what was going to happen. And in the commentary I use most of all for the story of, of Ezra, the commentator refers to the, to the hymn we sang the other Sunday, God Moves in a Mysterious Way. The clouds ye so much dread are big with mercy. Can you imagine the leaders of the Jews and the leaders of the work and the people themselves wondering, praying their hearts out to God? It's amazing how often we pray in fear rather than faith. Oh, Lord, Lord, we don't know what's going to happen. The Lord said, oh, but I know what's going to happen. In a, in a sense, the Lord said, oh, you're praying, you're praying, but, you know, your prayer's been answered. The men on horseback with the written decree sealed by King Darius, they're, they're already, they've, they've been two or three days on their journey. Your, your prayer's been answered. The clouds ye so much dread are big with mercy and shall break with blessings on your head. The adversaries, with their accusations of failure, had, of course, behind them Satan, the accuser, who's always seeking to disturb the peace of the people of God and the joy and the hope of the people of God, and he never gives up. And there's ground for believing that, that the enemy through the adversaries, the human adversaries, were demoralizing the people of God. And oh, they were preoccupied with their sins and their failures. And oh, it was, it was, it was close. Oh, there's, it's amazing the number of Christians who spend an awful lot of their valuable time preoccupied with their sins. But my friends, if we're Christians, our sins dealt with. They're put away. I turned over to the book of the prophet Zechariah. And I found one of the sermons Zechariah had to preach. And he told the people about this, Zechariah chapter 3. Then he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord. And Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, O Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was standing before the angel clothed with filthy garments. You see, sin, all the, with all the dirt and all the soiledness and all the guilt of it. Joshua was standing before the angel clothed with filthy garments. And the angel said to those who were standing before him, Remove the filthy garments from him. And to whom him he said, Behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you. And I will clothe you with rich apparel. And then I said, let him, let him put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him with garments. And the angel of the Lord was standing by and said, You, you see, my servant, not a spot, not a stain, nothing to accuse, nothing to let you trouble him with. Because all his sins are put away. Oh, we'll say in a few minutes at the Lord's table, speaking about the blood of Jesus Christ, shed for many for the remission. And that doesn't mean just the, the toning down of sin. It means the taking it away. You know the passage... I have been thinking about the book of Revelation, you see. In Revelation chapter 1, it speaks about the Savior who has loosed us from our sins. I remember learning from a commentary that that word loosed is a technical term that was used particularly in, in relation to the Roman soldiers. And they had their toga or their cape round their neck and it was fastened by a brooch or a clasp of some kind. But of course, you see, when they had to go into action, well, you don't want a cloak flapping around you. So all you had to do was to flick the clasp and you were loosed 
from the cloak and you went on without it. Now that's what it means when it speaks about our Savior Jesus Christ who has loosed us from our sins. And we go on with him and they're, they're left lying far behind and forgotten. Do you not want to forget your sins? Well, says God, why, why are you always bringing them up in your prayers? Haven't, haven't, you, haven't you more important, haven't you nicer things to speak to me about in prayer? Nicer things than your sins? Don't, don't you believe that I've forgiven you? What a God. What a God. When we look at chapter 6, in some ways I've expounded, well, the hymn, the last hymn, and what I've said already has really expounded the chapter. In verses 1 to 5 of chapter 6, we have the decree of Cyrus discovered after search in the archives. I've written into my notes here, this is an illustration of the importance of keeping records. That's why at every board meeting and every session meeting, the first thing we do after starting the meeting in prayer is to read the minutes. And I have to say to them, now, is that an accurate record of what took place? And if the members of the board or the session agree, then the minute is signed. You see, the records are important. I remember when I was moderator of Glasgow Presbytery on more than one occasion, there were difficulties, there were all sorts of difficulties with certain congregations, and this was brought up at Presbytery. And as the moderator, the, the chairman of the meeting, on a number of occasions, I had to say to the session clerk of the congregation that was appearing before Presbytery, would you read the appropriate paragraph from the minutes? And that was read, and that was the record of what happened. Well, they searched in the records of the archives of the capital and they found the decree of Cyrus. So the message was sent <coughs> back to the Jews and to their adversaries. And in verses 6 to 12 of our chapter, what we read about is how King Darius authorized the work of God to go on And Darius the king ordered the protection of the work of God. It's a marvelous verse, the seventh verse. Let the work on this house of God alone. And I could almost hear God Almighty saying, Amen. That's a permanent counsel to all who would oppose the work of God. It's not just a secular government. It is the ultimate government who is God himself who says, let the work on this house of God alone. Don't dare touch what belongs to God. <clears throat> and in verse 8, we find how God, through Darius, made divine provision for the work as well as divine protection. And there's something poetic of poetic justice, something akin to Gilbert and Sullivan's opera here about making the punishment fit the crime. These men in local government had opposed the work of God. Now they were told, get the work going and levy the rates pay the cost. It's not a good thing to fight against God. You never win. In verse 9, whatever is needed, the end of the verse, let that be given to them day by day without fail. There were legal sanctions added to it. Verse 12, now the these are the words of Darius, who was a pagan. He may have been religious, but he wasn't a believer in the God of salvation. May the God who has caused his name to dwell there 
in the temple of Jerusalem, overthrow any king or people that shall put forth a hand to alter this or to destroy this house of God which is in Jerusalem. God's name dwells there. God has chosen that place and God had chosen that people. And God has chosen this place and God has chosen this people. And if you say, oh, we've come to this place so many times and we've been blessed, you know the reason? Because God is here. When I prayed with the elders before we took our places, in that prayer we asked that right from the start of the service, God would signify his presence with us. And God is here. And God has blessed us already. God, who has caused his name to dwell there. And when you speak about the name of God, you speak about the person of God, you speak about the grace of God and the glory of God and the love of God and all that God is. God is here in all his attributes. Oh, you say, what's he here for? To bless the likes of you and me. What a God. I took the trouble to look up the 25th chapter of the book of Exodus and the story of the tabernacle before there was ever a temple. And in Exodus chapter 25 at verse 22 in that passage, there's, there's the description of the mercy seat. The law of God that was really judgment and the golden cover of that and the angels that constituted it the mercy seat. And on that mercy seat there would be sprinkled on the day of atonement the blood of the lamb that was sacrificed. And there at the mercy seat, God said, There where the blood of atonement is shed, I will meet with you. And when we remember his body that was broken and his blood that was shed, he still says, When you do this in remembrance of me, there I will meet you with you. Oh, think of it, my friends. God himself in his son, Jesus Christ, coming right close up to you personally to meet you at your very point of need and to bless you with the abundance of his blessing. In verses 13 to 15, we are told of how the temple was finished and it took just over four years. And then just a few weeks after the temple was finished, in verses 16 down to the end of the chapter, there was this great dedication service. And at the heart of the celebration, verse 17, there was the sin offering. They set in order the house of God according to the word of God to Moses. That's verse 18. And on the 14th day of the first month, verse 19, the returned exiles kept the Passover. We'll read at the Lord's table, Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Let us keep the feast. They kept the Passover. They went, they went right back to the heart and to the ground of their salvation. The Lamb of God that was slain to take away their sin and for their deliverance. 
They had been redeemed by the shedding of the blood of the spotless lamb. Do you see why we sang the hymn, Man of Sorrows? Oh, I hope you are blessed in it. Oh, there were so many, so many statements to bless you. The one I've written down here is, Sealed my pardon with his blood. Oh, you see, there's no doubt about it. Yes, yes, I'm a sinner. But I'm a forgiven sinner. And my pardon has been sealed by the blood of the Lamb that was shed. Not just forgiveness, but life and liberty and hope and service And this is what they were remembering. They were redeemed by God to be God's people. God had done it. And no one, not sin, not death, not the devil, could countermand what God had done for them. And they kept the feast just as we do this morning. They gave thanks to the God who had given them the victory. They gave themselves afresh to God. They began to have an impact of evangelism, verse 21, because other other people left their paganism and joined themselves to the people who had a God like this. And right where they had once failed, they began to be fruitful. They kept the feast, it says in the last verse, because the Lord had made them joyful. Their God had come to them and met them and helped them and blessed them and the door of the future was open for them. And they kept the feast with joy because the Lord had made them joyful. Come to the table then in faith, in surrender, And remember the sacrifice of the Son of God. Solemn, yes. According to thy gracious word, in meek humility, this will I do, my dying Lord. I will remember thee. Thy body broken for my sake, my bread from heaven shall be. Thy testamental cup I take, and thus remember thee. Gethsemane, can I forget? Or there thy conflict see, thine agony and bloody sweat, and not remember thee. When to the cross I turn mine eyes and rest on Calvary, O Lamb of God, my sacrifice, I must remember thee. Remember thee and all thy pains and all thy love to me. Yea, while a breath, a pulse remains, will I remember thee. And when these failing lips grow dumb, and mind and memory flee, when thou shalt in thy kingdom come, Jesus, remember me. Oh, yes, there's a solemnity. But they kept the feast with joy because the Lord had made them joyful and it is for that reason that I bid you now join together to sing our communion hymn which is number 311 the tune is number 292 my God and is thy table spread and does thy cup with love o'erflow Thither be all thy children led, and let them all its sweetness know. Think of the hymn we sometimes sing at an evening communion. The banner over, his banner over them was love. Hymn number 311, the tune 292.